Welcome to this third installment of the Ultimate Redstone Guide. So far in the two previous videos, we've been over all of the redstone components that create power, i.e. power components. And today we're diving into the three transmission components, or components that carry redstone signals. Starting off, of course, with redstone dust. We've talked briefly about dust in previous installments, but to summarize, redstone dust is the fundamental basis for all redstone contraptions. It can power adjacent redstone components and configure itself to point towards blocks that attract it, such as target blocks or most components. When pointing towards a block, it will weakly power the block it's pointing to, and it won't power any block it's not pointing to. And just by the way, when I say weakly powered, all I mean is that redstone dust is not able to pull a signal through the block, but other components can. So like in this example, this repeater is able to pull the signal out of the block, but not the dust, even though both the blocks are powered in the same way. If it was strongly powered, however, dust would be able to pull the signal out. And that's how you can tell the difference between weakly and strongly powered is just whether or not redstone dust is able to pull the signal out. Anyway, back to redstone dust. Redstone dust can also be right clicked into a dot. This significantly changes its behavior because it goes from powering adjacent blocks to just not doing that. <laughs> So if you ever need the block under it to be powered, but not adjacent blocks, use the dot. One last characteristic is dust instantly carries redstone signals for up to 15 blocks. And just really quickly, this power distance is known as the signal strength. The higher the signal strength, the longer the redstone dust will carry the signal. Each block the signal strength travels, it decreases by one, maxing out at 15, meaning that 16 blocks away from the power source, the redstone will be unpowered again. I explained this more in depth in our first video of the of the series, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to refer back to that video. But anyway, moving on. If you would ever need to send a redstone signal a long way, repeaters come in super handy for that. Basically, they take any signal strength and, well, repeat it, boosting it back up to a signal strength of 15, no matter what the input was. So you can kind of think of it like a Wi-Fi repeater. It grabs whatever signal it gets and repeats it at full power. Also, if you place a repeater directly into a block, it will always strong, strongly power the block it's facing, meaning you can pull the signal out through the block with redstone dust, as mentioned before. And one last thing on this note, they can also pull the signal out of weakly powered blocks. Another handy feature with the repeater is its customizable delay feature. By default, repeaters have one tick of delay, and its torches indicate its delay setting. So as they move away from each other, each position is one more tick of delay, maxing out at four ticks, and then it cycles back to one. Also, by the way, just real quick, one redstone tick is about one-tenth of a second, so that doesn't seem like a lot, but when repeaters are lined up in a row, it adds up quickly. So for example, in this line of repeaters, we have five repeaters, all set to four ticks of delay. If each tick is one tenth of a second, that means we have 20 ticks total equaling two seconds of delay. Whereas this line to the right is all set up to one tick, meaning we only have a half a second of delay. So when stacked, it makes a big difference. And it's a very commonly used feature, so it's good to know. Repeaters can also be locked in its current powered or unpowered state by running a powered repeater into the side of it. Basically, if the repeater is locked when it's off, it won't let any signal through, and vice versa. If it's locked when powered, then the repeater won't turn off until it's unlocked. And this is useful if you ever want to lock a line from changing states before you want to. For example, in my stopwatch I just recently designed, I used this locking repeater feature to prevent players from pushing the same button more than once, breaking the machine. So I would send the signal into the repeater, locking it when one button was pressed and then before it would be able to be pressed again well of course the player could push the button as many times as they wanted to but in order to prevent the signal from going into the machine I'd lock the repeater and prevent that signal from going in and messing things up. So it's a very uncommonly used feature I'd say in most redstone machines but it's a very specific use case and it's good to know. Okay now that we've got the hang of repeaters and how they can extend delay and lock signals let's level up and talk about something a bit more advanced. Comparators. Comparators might seem tricky at first, but they open up a whole new world of redstone possibilities. And while repeaters focus on strengthening and delaying signals, the comparator is all about comparing and managing them. So let's break down its 
confusing features. To start, here's a few quick facts about comparators. Like repeaters, they can pull a signal from a weakly powered block and they will always strongly power any block they send their signal into. Unlike repeaters, they've got a fixed one tick delay and comparators don't mess with the signal strength at all. They don't weaken it or strengthen it. So you can line up a whole bunch of them in a row without worrying about losing signal strength. And this is actually commonly used to extend signals from being a short signal to being a long signal. And perhaps I'll do a future video about pulse extenders. But anyway, the most common use for a comparator is measuring how full container blocks like chests or hoppers are. The signal strength it puts out is proportional to the fullness of the container. So if there's nothing in it, it's empty, the signal strength is zero. If it's about half full, the signal strength is eight. And if it's completely full, the signal strength is 15. And my texture pack here tells me all of the quantity amounts needed for each of the different signal strength. It's super handy. And there are instructions to download it down in the description if you want to. Anyway, this feature has many uses. It can be super handy if you're building something like a bulk storage silo with light indicators to show which chests are full. As you can see, these chests down here have the lights on indicating there's items in those chests, but the three on top don't. And we're just using comparators to tell whether or not there are items in the hoppers in this case, feeding items into each chest, but more on hoppers in the next video. The most complicated feature, and probably the reason comparators are deemed so confusing, is when you begin entering signals into the side of comparators. So, to break it down, comparators have two modes, compare and subtract. When the torch is off, that means it's in compare mode, it's default setting. So in this mode, it checks the signal strength coming into the back against the signals coming into the side. If the side signal is stronger, the comparator won't output anything. But if the side signal is weaker, it won't interfere at all with the output. In this case, 14 on the side is less than 15, so nothing happens to the output. However, if you were to switch these signals, then nothing would output at all because the side signal is now stronger than the back signal. I've used this feature before when I wanted a machine to monitor how full a chest was getting and activate a system, perhaps maybe to empty the chest, once it reached this certain level of quantity. So you might have to watch that back a few times to get it straight in your head, but once, it, once you get the hang of it, it's super useful. If you right click the comparator, it turns it into subtract mode with the torch on. This mode actually makes a little bit more sense to me and it might for you too. So basically, the comparator takes the signal coming into the side and subtracts it from the signal coming into the back. And then it outputs the difference to the front. In this case, the difference would be one because 15, the back input, minus 14, the side input equals one. Of course, the side input still needs to be weaker than the back input. Otherwise, the result would be less than zero and you get no output at all. So whether you're using subtract mode or compare mode, the side input always needs to be weaker than the back input or else you will get an output of zero. So to sum it up, in compare mode, the output is either true or false. It's either your back input outputted or zero. And then in subtract mode, it's outputting the difference between the back and side signals. Essentially, back minus the sides equal the output. So that should do it for the transmission video of our series. Next time we will dive into our mechanism components or components that interact with the world in some way. So if you want to learn more about those, be sure to check that out. If not, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.